think we probably should just get started. It's already 6.05. You bet. Um, just to kind of give everybody a heads up, uh, Connor said he would take on chapter 13. And then once we get through chapter 13, then I'll talk about chapter 14. And um, I don't know if we'll get through all the way through 14, but when I read the chapters, they seemed, you know, fairly short and pretty straightforward with a couple things, but um, we'll see how far we get. And then we'll make a decision on kind of where we go next and from there. So um, Connor, if you want to kick us off. All right, let me hit my... Uh screen share and file sorted out here. Um, where are we? I think I'll just have to mute it. All right. Um, so it's not done incorrectly, so it's gonna say chapter 11, but it is chapter 13 here. Um, let me share and Desktop two. Okay. Um, so I'll be going back and forth between our notes here and uh, the book itself and then some code. Um, so in general, um, I forgot this week, chapter 13, but uh, there it goes. Um, so shifting from a beginner's perspective, I guess, or beginner to intermediate perspective, to really understanding the underlying theory of reactivity, um, why it's different from the stuff you might've done when you started using R um, or other frameworks that do this sort of thing. So moving forward, um, the book says that Shiny is magic. And I think, you know, I agree. Like the first time I made a Shiny app that ran, it was pretty cool. Um, you know, 10 lines of code and it does what you want. Um, and it's easy to extend and, and to do more things. You can always make it complicated if you want. Um, but it's, it's consistent and they say it's good magic. And I think that, that means it's easy to get working but it also rewards a deeper understanding and deeper study because the further you, you dive into this, it's not a whole bunch of hacks to pile on top of each other and glued together. Like it actually, the, the, the underlying building blocks make sense together. <clears throat> so reactive programming focuses on changing on values that change over time and dependencies of calculations and actions that depend on those values. Um, so it's all about change management, just so changing. So you're, if your input changes, then you're gonna run some logic based on those inputs and then that updates your output. Um, interesting that in chapter 14, we find that in the execution of it, Shiny actually does it the other way around. Um, but this is at least my mental model blocking into it. Um, <clears throat> so Shiny is different from R. Most of R is you know, interactive, scripted. This is dynamic. Um, so it's all about ma managing dependencies, synchronizing inputs and outputs, and then being lazy and only computing when you have to. Um, because um, there's a lot of cases where these apps of, of a given scale can become expensive to run. And if, if they're callously using you know, compute power when they don't have to, that becomes a, a problem. Either in times of, of user experience because it load, takes forever to load or actual like budget dollars. If you're hitting the, that, if you're hitting the database every time when you, when you don't need to. Um, so they walk through a couple different examples of, of why Shiny needs to be a thing. Um, so here's an example of these variables, like they don't observe the environment and track changes and manage their dependencies. So if you're, if you're uh, translating from Celsius to Fahrenheit, um, you, can write, you can write this, this variable here and it uses temp C 
So there's a there's a implicit dependency here, but if you change temp c, temp f doesn't change because it's not tracking that dependency. Um, you can sort of do it with functions. Um, again, we're we're going from Celsius to Fahrenheit or or, or backwards. Um, this handles the dependency. So it, it calculates 50 based off of this calculation. And if you update the, the input, it tracks that dependency. So now it, it correctly converts it based on the new input. But it, if you look at this, they have this little uh, indicator here that says if it, it, yeah, it, it indicates if it actually had to do any, any computation. And here it does, even if, nothing changed from here to here. It still has to run the entire thing over again. Again, this is one line, so it you know, doesn't matter, but the principle is that you shouldn't compute if you don't have to. Um, so event-driven programming is something I've, I've never heard of, um, but you know, this is my first time like working with web interfaces and things in general, so there's probably a lot I don't know. Um, but this is an older problem, older solution to the same problem that that's trying to get at. Um, you can implement it in R. I was surprised with R6. I don't know anything about R6, R6 um, but it's a different class. Um, so so here it does it, it gets a value on update. That's how it gets the value, change the value on update. Um, it'll update itself, right? And then return that value. So this is how that works. Um, you can see that that if you change the Celsius temperature with the set command, it'll change, it'll identify that change in the input and update the calculation as necessary. Um, so that, that's pretty familiar in, in, the, in the grand scheme to Shiny. Pretty similar, um, but the syntax is very, very strange to me. Um, so it is very verbose. And the problem is that you, you have to track the dependency tree, you know, which inputs affects which outputs, um, which can be become you know impossible uh, if it gets um, to a certain complexity level. Um, and then you get into the, the trade-off of correctness versus performance. Um, it's not, not a good place to be. <clears throat> so reactive, um, I'm gonna switch to my code for this because I thought this is pretty interesting. Hey, Connor, if you don't mind yeah. me interrupting with that last comment or the, uh, the presentation. So the trade-off that you were uh, mentioning, performance versus correctness, the, the first thing that comes to mind from a from another similar use case would be data frame versus data table. Like they both do the same thing, just one is more optimized than the other. So when you're choosing your code base or when you're choosing your syntax, when you're writing your, your script or whatever the case may be, we've talked about data table uh, in, a, in a previous uh, book club uh, or, or previous sessions. Um, I just stumbled into this and I, I thought that that was a, a good um, real world example of, of what that last bullet statement uh, implied. The, the performance side of your computer versus the correctness, uh, the balancing act between the two. Um, Shiny does a good job of, of being able to manage that for us or, or the uh, uh, web interface calls, uh, the changes from R to, to web, um, mm. that, uh, that inflection anyway. So. Yeah, I definitely agree. It, it, it abstracts enough of the complexity away, but it still lets, still lets you dig down. And when you, when you take off the cover, the pieces still make sense. Um, so I'm definitely impressed with, with how the whole thing works. Um, but let's run this code here. So, so we're gonna create a reactive temp C. So again, you have to use those parentheses to, to make it run. So here it's going to return 10 because we set it to 10. We can change it to 20 just by feeding that into the function. 
and now it's at 20 here. And you can see that that create, get, set, that, that's similar to what they were doing in the R6 implementation. Um, so if you want to look at that code more carefully, you can make that comparison. Um, so this, this function here is reactive for temp F. It'll convert the Celsius to Fahrenheit. Um, and it'll message this converting whenever it has to actually compute something, right? So here, if we run temp F, it'll say converting and then 68. If we change this temp C to minus 10, that will change, that, that'll spur another update in the dependency tree. And now temp F will look at that minus 10 value instead of uh, 20 where it was previously. So here again, it, it has to compute because the input changed and now it's at 14, right? But if I run it again without changing the input of temp C, it doesn't say converting. And that's where you get into the caching aspect of this. So it only, it'll, it'll remember the last value. So it doesn't need to compute it again which can be, uh, I, I imagine that's a real benefit in the web UI side of things because you want the latency to be as low as possible. So if you can cut, if you can eliminate, eliminate computation for possible and use the cache value instead, then like, that's gonna show up on the, on the app as an improved user experience. Um, so this was interesting to me because you got to see how it tracks the dependencies and handles the dependency tree and validates things and then starts over again. And I think uh -huh. we get more and more into that in chapter 14. Well, what I was thinking about in that cache concept or reactive concept. So in most cloud-based, uh, rack space type, uh, uh, cost sorry, the price for running a server in the cloud. So if that's AWS, DigitalOcean, or any other uh, vendor, their price model is always based on CPU flops. So if you run unoptimized code, obviously the cost is going to be very expensive monetarily just to run this particular script. But if you optimize it and, and you reduce the number of calculations or, or calls back and forth between client and UI, I'm oh, sorry, client and server, you're not only going to see a performance benefit, but also less uh, weight on your on your checkbook when you're when you're paying your bill uh, to that to that service. Uh, uh, Colin, have you uh, ran into this at all with your your uh, current application at all? The actual monetary value of running that service. Um, I'll pay service. I really haven't. I really haven't put a shiny application onto like a, a cloud service just okay. yet. But I mean, you know, computing so so cheap. But you know, if you scale yeah. it up, I mean, it, I guess it depends on your user base and how much processing you have to have. Um, you know, it definitely. You know, you are. It, it is correct. Like it's going to cost more money, but it's you know, it's going to depend on what, at what scale you're working at. Is yeah. what I was kind of thinking of. Um, for what, what I do, I mean, you're talking pennies on the dollar, right. but I could, but I could see in a different application of, you know, you have thousands of users, hundreds of thousands of users, yeah. uh, then I could see it adding up quite a bit. Right. And it's, it's not, it's not just the money aspect. Like also if it's doing computation where it doesn't need to, that'll slow the whole thing down. Yeah, the you, users you, not to be happy. Yeah, you can't get to 100,000 users if you have a really poor web experience. Right. <laughs> so you got to uh, have one, one problem before you have it, the other problem. Yeah. Um, my question was, is like this, this idea of caching, right? Like with variables, it makes sense to me, right? It caches it in memory and it's like, it's on a specific location, you know, in memory and you can find the actual address for that memory. But in the case of a, a reactive context, my question is, is where is this, where is it caching? Is it caching it in memory or is it just caching it in the um, reactive environment to which we've created? I, 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 if I had to guess, it's, it's an environment. Um, 
And this gets into the, the invalidation part, which I think comes up in the next chapter. Um, like it retains that last value. So it'll reuse that until that value is invalidated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, that, and, that's, and that's where I was kind of figuring out, I was like, where? Like, is it just in memory and it's in a physical location? Like when we do it like interactively, right? Like if you assign a variable, you can find the specific location on memory. You can actually get the address of where that variable has been assigned or not variable where that value has been assigned. And so I was just wondering if like, I don't know if anybody had any insight maybe it's, maybe I'm just thinking about it too much, but like if there is a location that it is stored once it's cached. Yeah, let me see if, if you can do that. So we have- Oh, go ahead, sorry. We have these values here in the environment, in the global environment, right? We made this temp F and temp C and so I just did the list on everything in the environment. So if you do st structure of temp C, yeah, so it's, it is stored in there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is R6, okay. And that value is 10. So then if you, so if temp C is, is now, is now five and run that structure call again. Now it's five. Mm. Mm. So I, I'm, I think it's embedded in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because then the question that I get, you know, because we it goes back to the conversation of like, and, and again, I may be overthinking this, so I'm kind of thinking out loud, but, um, you know, you have that split between the UI and server, right? And so where is it caching it? Is it caching it on the UI side? So if our user is using it on their computer in their browser, or is it on the server side on our servers where it's cached? Mm, okay, yeah, I don't know about that. That'd be interesting. Uh, I mean, I was just wondering because that's what I was thinking. I was like, well, where is this? Where is this caching it? Is it caching it in browser? But, or is it caching it on server? So like, well, because, but if an input changes, then, you know, it's going to, it's going to go through the invalidation flow like it usually does. And then it will, but I see Ryan has, has a, has something to say. So. No, I was, I was going to add to the comment. I, I, I would have to believe based on the design of the application or shiny in general, that the caching would have to be on the user's end. So, okay, so when you compile the shiny app and, and you, you present it on the web server, right? You are making this get put call, uh, uh, you know, response action between the browser of the client and the server itself. I would have to believe that the caching of a reactive code would have to be on the user's side because you're the one changing it. The user's the one changing it. The cost of, of like you had mentioned uh, a moment ago, Colin, with 100,000 users, you can't expect the server to store all of that. That would not be cost beneficial, right? I would think that asynchronously, each one of the users that are interacting with that web server, it's stored on their user client side. Make sense? Yeah. And it kind of goes back to like chapter one. Yeah. I remember there was like a diagram that yeah. there's a diagram of like every user is going to get a separate UI. Oh no. Every user is going to get the same UI experience, but they're going to get a separate server. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thread. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and threading is, is a different subject, but it, it, yeah, the, the actual handshake between the server and that one client that's, well, uh, if you want, I can give you a, a quick, um, uh, link for the difference between Apache and PHP versus Nginx and, and multi-threading. They're very, very, very different in their architecture. One is more efficient at, at one application where another is better suited for other services. Point being is that the, the, the difference between the two and the way that call is being made. Um, let me find that article and I'll, I'll fire it off to the, to the group. Um, I don't want to interrupt with Connor's presentation. I have to believe that the caching though, uh, uh, or at least this variable 
isn't on the server's side. I, I, I can't in good faith believe that that would be an optimal way, just understanding the sheer volume of people that may be interacting with this server. Um, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, let, me, let me find that article and I'll fire it off. Um, yeah, so, so we're, we ended here with lazy. So it only does, does work when it's cold and it's cached. So it only does work on the first call which can save a lot of time and money. Um, so history, um, if you've ever done Excel, you've done reactive programming, <laughs> congratulations or condolences. Um, it's got some academic background, some research done into it. Um, I, I'm not a big JavaScript guy, but, but these are some of the, some of the older uh, frameworks for, for doing reactive in JavaScript, and now there's React, obviously, in Vue and Angular. Um, but the book notes that it, this range of programming is, is a general term, and it, uh, the actual implementation can, can vary a lot um, across libraries. So I think that was, that was the chapter. Let me see if I had anything else I wanted to hit. Um, so I think the, the main the main part of, of, of this chapter is the is, is the lazy and and caching. And, and that's the, the two core points of of the difference between like storing your ver your stuff in static variables or doing functional programming. Um, like those things don't handle the dependency tree and input validation and validation process. So I think if you, if you can understand why Shiny is lazy and why it uses caching, then you'll understand most things about it. That's all, so, that's all I had. Are there any, uh, any other discussion points? So I want to kind of go back to you were you were doing some stuff with like the um, with like environment, like looking mm -hmm. at like the objects in the environment. What's that environment function do? What what does that do? I'm not familiar with it. Um, so environment just um, I think it asks which environment it's in. Okay. So if you run this within a function, it'll probably say it's it's the environment is that function. Hmm. Whereas if you run it in the console straight up you're in the global environment, right? That makes sense. So like when you're, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so go ahead, sorry. Oh, well, I was thinking like, if you were scroll up on like line up, like when you were doing, I think it's like the top of this code chunk you right have here when you were doing like the temp F, temp C. Yeah. Um, so, cause it kicks us into a, cause there's like a function called reactive something. Um, Yes. Oh, yeah. Here. Yeah, yeah. And that that reactive console kicks you into a reactive environment. Correct. Right. So okay. this is no longer your classic R scripting style. These are you. These are now like you can see it. It it is reactive at this point. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, but you're still technically in your global environment, though. Mm. Yeah, because 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 I'm just in a Markdown document. Oh, okay. 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 Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I don't know I, how it would look if you, if you did, if you ran that environment line inside an app and then like piped that into a message, I wonder what it would say. Hmm. Yeah. Cause like, cause the whole, I mean, the reactive context is starting to click a little bit more for me. Like it's making a little bit more sense. But then when it was talking about the reactive console, this function reactive console to get these reactive functions to work or these reactive values to work mm -hmm. kind of threw me off. And I was like, okay, are, is it kicking us into a different environment now or is it the same environment? But I might be overthinking it too. I think, I don't think it changes the environment. It, it, it uh, I think it just pretends that it's a shiny app now. It, it puts on a shiny hat and, and plays pretend.
I think that was all the questions that I had. Ryan, do you have any? I was say I'm off on a tangent right now. I uh, I was trying to answer the uh, the uh, threading comment first, and then while you guys were talking about the caching bit, the reactive uh, uh, console uh, that got me thinking of another uh, another instance. So my curiosity, call, uh, Connor, would be if we were to run this in a, a true shiny web server, right? So just say that you you capture your uh, client server side exchange here and then run it into an actual Shiny server, would we be able to go into developer tools and see maybe where that caching possibility would occur? I don't know how that would work uh, without actually building or, or trying the, the uh, chapter code at all. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, that might be a fun experiment, but I don't, I don't want to take any time. No, huh? no agreed here. Yeah, yeah. Because like that, was, that was more, I read that and that was, had more meat on the bones than 13, I think. So I'll let, I'll, I'll stop sharing here. I'm gonna call and take over. Cool, thanks Connor, I really appreciate that. Um, it, was, it was really cool to see. Um, like I said, I'm still getting used to reactivity and I thought it was actually kind of neat when, uh, <laughs> I thought it was kind of neat when they said, hey, if you've worked in, uh, if you've worked in like Sheets or you've worked in Excel and you've used functions before, You've done reactive programming, so it made me feel a little bit better because I've done some of that stuff, and I know uh, tracking the dependencies for that, especially very complicated sheets, or if you're trying to create a dashboard in Excel, you you kind of know um, how much pain you go through doing that. So it made yeah. me feel a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely lost like entire days just trying to track down why this VLOOKUP isn't doing what I expect because I wasn't <laughs> tracking the dependency tree. <laughs> or like if you're like doing like what is it like double dollar sign single dollar sign mm -hmm. to maintain the yeah so yeah i don't miss those days by any means that's <laughs> why anyway. i learned r just to get out of that <laughs> uh um anyways so uh thanks thanks again connor i appreciate that so we're going to start talking about chapter 14 here um let me share my screen go to desktop two can everybody see uh, let me bump this up so people can see it a little bit better. Yep. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is, um, oh, that's a little too much. Uh, we're going to talk about the reactive graph. And I think the first sentence of the chapter, you know, Hadley says this, to understand reactive comp computation, you must understand the reactive graph. And so, uh, and I remember there was a point, probably when we were doing like chapter six or seven, I remember saying, saying I remember saying in the group, like, Hey, that's great that we're learning all this stuff, but where's the reactive graph? Like, we're not we're not talking about it anymore. Hadley said it was important to know about, um, but now with chapter fourteen, we get to dig into it a little bit more. And so this chapter it overviews the reactive graph, so it kind of does a little bit of review about the different components. It explains how reactive components are linked to each other. It also describes the steps in which reactive graph elements are executed and how those dependencies are established. And it overviews the React log package to help us observe the reactive graph for any application that you may come across. I do want to kind of say that before I read this chapter, I took its advice and went back and read chapter three. And I think after you've kind of had a little bit of experience working with Shiny, going through some of the, you know, kind of the Shiny in action stuff, and then going back and reading chapter three, reading chapter 14 again, it really kind of helps solidify like the importance of the reactive graph and, and how Shiny kind of works under the hood. So just out of a quick review of those things, and Connor already kind of talked about this, but when we're working in a Shiny context, we're um, using more declarative type of programming versus imperative. And so if you're coming more from R when you're first starting to write scripts, you know, you're writing, you know, top to bottom, it runs left to right. And so, you know, it's really focused on trying to get uh, just to kind of get run from like A to B. But Shiny is a little bit different. It's it's declarative in nature. And so it's not necessarily uh, as linear going from A to B. Um, and so I kind of went back and pulled this quote from chapter three, because I think it really kind of shows the difference between imperative versus declarative uh, types of programming. So um, imperative types of programming is more focused on, like a saying, like make me a sandwich, 
when declarative types of programming are more like ensure there's a sandwich in the refrigerator when I look inside of it. And so when we're, just to reiterate the point again, when we're developing the shiny context, we're developing instructions. And so when we provide an input, those instructions are run and they're available for us and they define how the application behaves. It's not necessarily creating anything, but it's just the instructions are available to us. Um, also, Connor reiterated the fact about laziness, you know, only do what is necessary. Um, you know, again, to save on computation, uh, Shiny is, is lazy. It's only going to run what it needs to. And then um, also, because of this laziness, this can make it kind of hard to debug sometimes. Um, and so that's just something to consider with laziness is you got to kind of know what are the dependencies and how Shiny runs under the hood um, and how laziness contributes to that so that you can debug your issues faster so you can debug your apps a lot faster. So it also talks about the reactive graph notation. Um, again, it really kind of breaks it down into those three components, those inputs, reactive in expressions, and then outputs. And then if you want to go a little bit further, if you remember in chapter three, it talks about um, producers and consumers. Inputs and reactive expressions are producers and reactive expressions are also producers along with our consumers along with outputs and observers. And so that's kind of an important point to remember from chapter three. And then this was probably one of the biggest things to take away from this chapter because it talks about the actual invalidation or the actual flow that Shiny goes through to um, validate the inputs leading to the outputs is that execution order is not top to bottom, but it's determined by the reactive graph. And so it's not necessarily just a linear process. It's determined by the actual reactive graph and what those dependencies are within that reactive graph. And so um, again, this works by, um, this only works in, in a reactive context and how we do that within the server code is we're using reactive expressions using functions like reactive or observers using observe event. Okay. So does anybody have any questions about this kind of like quick review about basic reactivity? Like I, like I said, I, I really think it goes back to, you know, once you read chapter 14 and go read chapter three again, it, for me, it made a lot of sense for somebody who hasn't like done a lot of shiny development. It started to kind of click a little bit more. So uh, the book kind of starts talking about this basic introduction. It, it really talks about theory. There's not really a lot of like heavy coding and there's not a lot of heavy shiny coding. It's more kind of focused on talking about like the actual reactive graph itself. And so it really kind of just develops this kind of toy application. It does give you an example, some example code that would highlight this application right here. But basically what this is, is this is kind of the model that we're gonna follow to kind of talk about those, that reactive execution that occurs within a Shiny app. Again, the big thing to point out is, is that we have our outputs and our observers, we have our reactive expressions, and then we have our inputs, and that each of these lines indicate specific dependencies on each other. So. Here, our outputs are dependent on this reactive expression, which has a dependency on this reactive expression, and then this input, okay? And so this reactive graph will determine how our application executes. It's not how the code is ordered, but it is how the graph is, um, how the graph is set up on the back end of it. So the book kind of talk goes through the reactive execution step by step. You can look at this in the book, but I also thought that this example from the React log package was a little bit more informative than what was in the book. So these are linked in the review materials. I didn't find this one. I actually found it from someone from the previous cohort and I kind of read through this. And I thought this one did a little, it was a little bit more clear on how this uh, reactive life cycle actually takes place when the application starts and how it goes through the validation steps. And so I'm gonna kind of walk through each of these steps, you know, uh, one by one and kind of show how this kind of reactive life cycle works. And so when we first start here, we can see that we're kind of in an invalidation state. 
And so right now in this state, this is like in when our application first kicks off. And so when the application first kicks off, we can see that our outputs are invalidated. That's why they're gray. Our reactive expressions are also invalidated as well. But now we have our inputs that are validated. We have inputs. And again, those inputs might be our sliders, our selectors, our, our numeric inputs, whatever they may be. So this is the first initial state of the application when it first kicks off. Once it starts to execute, Shiny is going to first pick one of those. Um, it's going to pick a uh, output to create the graph from. Now, one thing to keep in mind is, and the documentation that I've been reading, it says that it's just going to pick these outputs at random. It's not going to have a specific step-by-step -step flow of how they actually, uh, how they actually are um, kicked off. And so it's going to be at random. Now, I did read somewhere that there are ways to limit that, but that's a little bit beyond my knowledge. And we can have a conversation about that if we need to. But um, for, all, for, our, for our understanding right now, it's just easier to just take for a fact that these are going to be random. Shiny is going to pick these at random to execute. So once it does this, it's going to move into figuring out the, it's going to figure out what are the dependencies for the reactive expressions. And so it's going to go first before this is completed running, it's going to start developing the dependencies within the graph. And so we can see here within this specific example here, there's, there's this output has a dependency of this specific reactive expression. And so it generates this arrow here to show that relationship. And so this reactive expression needs to be validated first and run before this output can complete its run. But there's more dependencies before this can be completed. So this reactive expression actually has another dependencies on this input. And so we create this other arrow to show this relationship between this reactive expression and this input right here. Now that we have this reactive expression complete, it's gonna go through and look at other dependencies that it has. This reactive expression also has a dependency on this reactive expression, which also has a dependency on this input right here. And now that we have all of these dependencies that are set up, the observer can actually have a complete run and it turns green, okay? Once it does this, it's gonna move on to the next output and then it's gonna kind of follow the same flow. It's gonna look at the reactive expressions, develop the dependencies for that, look for any other dependencies in regards to other inputs or other reactive expressions, and then it's gonna complete that run again. So, so, so I don't repeat myself again. I mean, it's just the same flow. It's just gonna develop those dependencies until all of our outputs are um, validated. And pretty much once we get to this state where every single output has been run, uh, we get into a state where our application is, uh, is idle and it's complete running, it's done. However, the issue is, is that this isn't static, it's a dynamic process. And so what happens in situations where an input changes? So for example, if in a Shiny application, say our user decides to move their slider button, or they decide to change their um, numeric selection or whatever it may be. In this case, what happens is, is that that input becomes invalidated. Once this happens, all the dependencies in this flow um, get invalidated and we start this process all over again. And so you can see that because this, because this output had a dependency on all of these reactive expressions, and they had this dependency on this input, all of these become invalidated again, and it goes through that same flow, de uh, determining what are the actual um, relationships between each one of these elements of the reactive graph. Okay. Uh, execution. So that's pretty much like the step by step of how how the how the uh, reactive life cycle goes. What questions do anybody have about this kind of step-by-step -step process? It was pretty straightforward. I mean, I don't think there was anything too complicated about it. Um, 
there are a couple of situations, a couple of examples in the, in the book, especially with the exercises that kind of challenge you to kind of think about how these dependencies are related to each other. And we'll get to that here in a second. So. Um, yeah, I think I was most, most um, interested in the relationship part, how it, it doesn't remember any of those links, which, yeah. which at first seems like inefficient, but if the if the react um, like if the log can change, then you don't want it to remember because otherwise you're looking you're trying to do something that that's invalid. Yeah, and I think there's there's an exercise that kind of uh, reiterates there. There's like an example, um, like in the dyna dynamism section, that really gets at that about um, you know how those relationships are established. And I do also, and I do agree with you, Connor, too, because I was interested in that, too, is, is how are these connections determined? Like, how does Shiny actually go through and determine these connections? And so I, I'm wondering if it has to do with those list objects of our inputs and our outputs, if that partly, because we're, you know, we're, we're creating objects to which get added into those input and output lists. And so... I think it has to do something with those objects, but I did have that same question too when I was reading it is how does it determine these relationships and how does it know to establish these connections? So Ryan, do you have any input on that? There's, well, there's a part of this that I, I just, I've, I've always had difficulty learning and that is when it's in, in ephemeral space, you can't touch it, you can't see it. There's no way that you can interact with it other than you get an output. Well, how does that actually work? I've always, I've always wished that we would have more of a visual representation of the, the calls as a script is being ran. And we can do that with, uh, and I don't remember the, uh, the actual call that you make. It's not bookmarking. It is uh, uh, something that you do in your Shiny where you add like a pause point and then it opens up the window and you can see your, your code execution on the, on the right-hand side. Um, Colin, you use that a lot when you're- oh, browser. Browser, that's the browser. word, yes, started with a B. The, uh, I enjoy watching that occur and then adding the comprehension of what this reactive diagramming is doing as you're seeing the, the highlighting of your code in execution. Um, I was curious if, if this React log package would actually you know, draw these images for you, but I don't think that's the case. Um, in a in a in a twist of fate similar concept, Frederica just uh, presented her network diagram uh, uh, section of ggplot, and so that got me thinking of how can you access you know like your GitHub branching merging uh, tree right between that diagram, being able to have our studio or have this this application. Uh, build those diagrams for you to establish the linkage visually now starts to give more credibility to what code you're writing. I may be off on a tangent here. Um, Colin, your, your, your comprehension is really around the, the reactive concept of, of web calling. For me, it's always this visual uh, wish list. I've always wished that I could see code execution without the CPU actually processing it or, you know, I watch it in real time. I don't know if anybody else has that same trait, uh, very visual learner. No, I, I totally agree. I totally agree with mm -hmm. that statement. Like yeah. I, I'll, I'll like read the chapter and be like, you know, I could, I could figure out a way how to visualize this, but I just, you know, I have a week to put this together. You know what I mean? And Agreed. So, yes. Yes. Well, uh, uh, like UML diagramming or, or I, I if you ever, Look, checked out flow. Uh, that's another way. Um, there's a couple of packages, at least in web development, that you can you can visualize the code execution, and it actually stitches everything together for you. Um, I like these diagrams. I guess is my my whole point. Um, how they were generated, or, or or what they're implying into the code execution. We can't see this happening, right? You can't you can't physically see it happen. Um, I'm probably being a little too wishful for my for my uh, own personal need, but um, if it would highlight right like the line connection between uh, you know your input, your reactive, and then the output cell, 
what was the path that was taken to establish that kind of concept? No, I totally agree with that. Like, you know, when you're sitting here and you're looking at this, this graphic here, you know, yes. these, these step-by-steps, like, yeah, it makes sense of how this flow actually works, but like, right. what are the connecting pieces to this? Like, it has to be an object, you know, and that's why I keep going back to, I think it's the input output objects that are being passed along because we physically give a name to this output here. Uh, we don't label a we can't, we don't label a reactive expression, but we do give a, we do give a, a name to the input too, but yeah, it's not very clear to me how it's determining this relationship here. Right. Cause we, we don't give like the reactive expression doesn't have a name. Well, right. but you are calling it though. Like, remember like, um, the equation or the, the logic, the math, the whatever function it is that you're calling on. Yeah, you're kind of calling it like a function. So there is somewhat of a connection that way from like an output to a reactive expression. Right. But I know what you're saying. I wish there was a more intuitive like model. Like this makes sense to show the connections and how it runs, but it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't dive deeper into how this relationship is established. And I think, I think a diagram would make that a lot more clear of how that works. Um, excellent point though. Like I said, I wish I had more than a week to like dig into it and be like, cause there's times I sit there thinking like, oh man, I really could put this together and it'd be really cool, but I don't have time to do it. <laughs> um, so the next thing that it kind of talks about is the exercises. And I think this will probably be the last thing we talk about tonight. Cause we could talk about dynamism and, react log next week. Um, but it, the, the books has some exercises that it asks you to go through. Um, so I'm just going to kind of quick go through them here and kind of go through the answers. Um, I think one was pretty straightforward. It asks you to draw a reactive graph for the following server function, and then explain why the reactives are not run. And so if you actually plot out the, um, reactive graph, and this is what I have. And so if it's wrong, let me know. If you plot it out, there's technically no outputs in this reactive graph. And if there are no outputs in the reactive graph, then it can't go through, it can't, it's like, it's invalidated. There's no, there's no way to invalidate it. So it's, it's in a state of, you know, being invalidated. And so it can't go through its process of figuring out what are the dependencies and what are the inputs that are needed to fulfill that dependency tree. So um, that's what I had. Did anybody have anything else or I think this one was pretty straightforward because it's like, there's no outputs. If you don't have any outputs, you can't go through the reactive life cycle. <laughs> um, number two was a little bit, was a little more challenging for me. Uh, so it talks about the following reactive graphs that simulates long running computation by using sys.sleep. And so um, I don't, how I kind of tackled this or how I, how I tried to tackle it was, and I know this isn't exactly correct because we're actually using react valves and we don't have any in, technically any inputs, but I decided to say, all right, well, let's just treat them as inputs and then walk through what it would look like. And so, you know, I'm treating these react valves as, as inputs and then treating like Y1, Y2, Y3 as reactive expressions. And then this observe function as an output. Um, I don't know if that's technically, technically correct, but I think it kind of helped me kind of think about it. And so the question asks, how long will the graph take to recompute if X1 changes? So that's, to me, I thought, well, that's kind of like an input. If an input changes, then this should change as well. And it asks, how long should it take and if you're not familiar with syssleep, all syssleep does is it just pauses execution for you know one second or how many ever seconds you want to put into it. So I decided to draw it out like this. And so I was thinking about it. So I was thinking that if X1 changes, so saying that this input changes, my thought was thinking that all of these dependencies would drop, right? All of these dependencies would drop and so it would have to rerun this one expression here, which is Y1. 
and it only has one sys sleep into it. So I said it would only take one second. Now, if X2 changes, that means that this dependencies are the dependencies of the relationships between Y2 and Y3 all drop. And so if Y2 and Y3 drop, they have to re-execute to make those connections again. So it would be sysleep1, sysleep2. So I thought that was two seconds. Now, I thought this was getting kind of tricky with this X2, X3, Y2, Y2. I think this was a trick question because if Y2 has already been executed, it's already cached. And so it wouldn't need to run again. So I think he was trying to trip us up here by getting people to think it was going to run for mm -hmm. two seconds. But if you go to the reactive graph, if X3 changes, there's only one dependency here. And since this dependency is kill, or well, there's technically two, if you count the observer in here, it only has to rerun this Y3 again, and it's going to be one second. That's the way I interpreted it, but there were times where I was kind of going back and forth. I don't know if anybody has another viewpoint on it. And I could be totally off base too, because I'm, I'm treating those reactive values as inputs in my answer. And I don't know if that was necessarily right or wrong. I think I agree. Okay. It threw me off because like, because I was sitting there thinking about like, well, if Y2 just drops off, you know, what dependencies, I think the big picture with this is, is that you have to look at what are the dependencies. And if one input changes, it drops all those dependencies and the reactive graph has to go through and figure out what those dependency relationships are again. That's the big picture of it. Um, and so that's what it was for that. Uh, question number three, what happens if you attempt to create a reactive graph with cycles? I had a little bit of trouble with this one, but then I saw somebody had, the, had an answer from the previous cohort and they call it recursion. Are they, they referred to recursion as the answer and they had a really funny picture for it. Um, but it's this idea of an infinite loop. Look at 252, 252. <laughs> infinite loop. And so it started to make a little bit more sense of like, if you try and do cycles, like the book is acting, you're, you're getting into a situation of recursion. And it kind of reminded me, I think Ryan, you had a couple of examples of that if you get into this thing, you know, you'll just get into an infinite loop. And, you know, since resources are not infinite, there will be a time that it could crash your system. So, um, but I don't know, that's, that's what I got from the interpretation of it. But I really thought this was the best way to, to represent it. Yep. <laughs> cool. Um, we're already at seven o'clock. Yeah, I think we could save dynamism in the React log for next week um, if anybody objects to that. I really don't want to go over the hour. Um, no, that sounds good. Okay, cool. That's good. All right, cool. Well, um, and I can hang out for a couple of minutes if people want to kind of talk about this, what we talked about a little bit more tonight. Um, but next week we'll talk about, I'll finish up dynamism and then we'll finish up the react log package and then talk through a couple of more examples. And um, I mean, if anybody wants to take 15 reactive building blocks, I'm open to that, or I can just put an open call on Slack. Um, but you know, if anybody wants to do it, just let me know on the Slack and we can go from there. So, but. all right. I would, I'd be willing to volunteer for it. My only concern I'm, I'm presenting on Saturday and presenting on Wednesday. Um, Saturday's presentation isn't put together yet. And Wednesday uh, is for the uh, engineering shiny. And that one I'm actually going to try and, and put all of the, uh, everything that we've learned together uh, into uh, migration onto the actual web server itself, uh, uh, packaging and, and then deployment onto the web server. Uh, it may take me a little bit of time. I, I, I don't want Connor or Colin to feel bad that you're, you're presenting again, but um, if, if we're in a pinch, I'd be more than happy to, to throw something or cobble something together if that would help um, offset the, the shared load of presentation. No, I, I, I could put it out there too. I mean, maybe, you know, Kevin couldn't join us tonight, but maybe Kevin can do it or something like that. If not, I mean, I'm, I'm cool with doing it too. I just want to make sure I give the group, you know, opportunities 
Um, so I'm not like just taking them all because <laughs> right. I still have a very naive understanding of all this stuff. So, <laughs> well, I did want to, I did want to pause for a second. Um, and let me go back to the book, scroll down further. So oh. when, when we get to the, uh, reactive log package, it does actually build in a visual form, right? Um, if we scroll down to figure, uh, 14, 16. Mm -hmm. So it will, this package will build an output then, correct? Yeah, it will. I mean, okay. I mean, if you guys want to hang out for a little bit longer, um, like I said, I don't want to like, uh, I don't want to force anybody to stay if they can't stay. Um, but if I go to examples, I had an example of this somewhere. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out where my notes are. Oh, I'm going to kill my notes. Sorry. Viewer. So 14, exercise dynamism. So I think I was going to use it for this example because it made a lot of sense. But like if you, it's this is a very simple example where it talks about, you know, it has a very basic choice, A or B, and then it will, you know, change the input. And it was, we'll talk about this next week, but it, you know, talks about laziness and, and what, you know, what dependencies actually get created. Yeah. Um, but to show you the react log, let's just take this and dump it over into the book club console. So if you have this, um, if you go control F3, uh, was our command F3, sorry. What am I doing wrong here? Control F3. There it is. Oh, oh so I have to. Had to relax. Yep. Yep. So I have to I have to have it set. So control D. And then and then go. There it is. Okay. So um, it will actually create the reactive graph for you. Um, what also is nice about this too, is you can actually record the, and again, I'm not an expert with react log. This was kind of the most time I've spent with it was this week is like, if you want to interact with your app a couple of times, like to kind of just see what it is, it will record in the background and so if you um, control F3, you'll have all of the different like steps that happened within it. And it gives you like what's actually happening when the user is interacting with it. So, so I was, oh, go ahead. There is a way that you can visualize it then so that the, the service actually works. And I'm, I know I'm sounding very, very extremely naive here because I didn't do the, the, the uh, exercises in the chapter. So I didn't realize that this was a option within Shiny. This is actually amazing. Um, yeah, this is its own separate package. Like React Log is its own separate package that you can use. Um, and I mean, for a basic application, it's not so bad or it's not really, it's useful to see like the concepts, but I think React Log was really important if you have like a very large application and you're trying right. to, like dig into like what are all the dependencies and um, kind of see how that behavior actually interacts with the application with the user inputs and everything. And so um, this one actually is really nice for this example here because um, it kind of shows you those dependencies because there's a conditional here. There's a conditional in here where it's like your input choice if it's A, it's going to treat it as input A or input, input B. And so um, it really kind of shows as you change the input choice, it will select which input dependency is actually generated. Okay. Um, and so, and like I said, as I've changed it, you can see like kind of the behavior of it. So it's in an idle state right now. I made a change to an input where I changed choice. And since I've invalidated this, it's going to invalidate this input or this output. Yeah. invalidates it and then so this relationship will be um, taken away 
it, within the React log, this the dotted lines means that there is a potential connection or there was a connection to it previously. I see. So that kind of throwed, threw me off there a couple of times too. But again, because it was invalidated, it's going to go through that same life cycle flow. Again, generate that dependency for choice, go through that conditional. And I think it's now B and then it will be in an idle state now. So very cool. Very cool. Yeah, this was the most time I've spent with it this week. Like, um, it's when I first used this, when I was using it with like some shiny apps I was developing a long time ago, I was like, I have no idea what this means. But now it's like, now it makes a lot more sense. And two, the other thing to remember too is, is that this is a recording of all of the behavior. Um, it's not just the reactive graph. It's, it's a recording of the user behavior. And so that kind of threw me off too. When I first started playing around with this, I was like, I don't understand what these, these forward and back buttons do. Like, I just want to see the reactive graph and how things are connected. But then you've, you realize it's a recording tool. It's actually recording yep. that reactive life cycle. So. Yeah. I've got to plug this into one of my apps just to see what it looks like. Yeah, it, awesome. it gets it gets crazy when you have like a very large application. Like if you go find an application that's like super large on um, like if you go find one open source and do it, it's just the graph gets so big. <laughs> but it helps. It definitely helps um, pick apart like what the dependencies are, um, and so on and so forth. So, what other questions you guys got? My mind is blown again every week. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm just like, I mean, it's so like, you know, Connor said at the start, it's so simple, but it just blows your mind because it's, it's, it's simplicity. Like it can get super complex, but at the, at the core of it, it's actually really, it's really, it's a lot of simple concepts that are built together to give you a lot of flexibility. And so 